Hey guys, so uh, wanted to get us into the lab here today. And one of the bigger themes in this chapter is this idea of solubility. And if we take two aqueous solutions that are naturally soluble, sometimes when we mix those together, we can trigger a double replacement reaction. And one of our two products is a uh, insoluble precipitate. So one of the methods that they came up with of determining uh, the oxidation state of transition metals, you know how in the middle of the table they can carry plus two or plus three, and it all kind of depends on what happens with their 3D electrons. One way they found to figure out that ratio uh, was by doing an experiment called the continuing variations method. And that's what today's lab is all about. All right, so uh, the title of the lab is Determining the Stoichiometry of a Reaction. But like I said, what's governing what's happening today in the lab is something called the continuing variations method. Because what you're going to do is continuously, one after the other, vary the amount of each of the reactants that you put in. When you vary this, you're going to start with one substance being a limiting reactant, limiting the amount of precipitate you get. And then as you keep varying the ratios, it's going to switch to that the other substance is going to be the limiting reactant. And the maximum amount of product that we're going to get is when both substance are added in what we call stoichiometric amounts, where both of them run out at the same time, which is the limiting reactant right? Both of them at the same time. And the idea behind the continuing variations method is even if the ratios I choose aren't the exact correct ratio, because I can extrapolate these things graphically, I can determine what that's going to be, even if I didn't trial and error it the right way. So you're not really trial and erroring it. You're running a series of ratios. And from those, we should be able to figure out what the coefficients, the ratio of those substances are in a reaction. So here are the big ideas that govern what we're going to do in that lab. Right. We're going to graph the amount of product, particularly precipitate, right, generated from the reaction to determine the mole ratio. The maximum amount of product indicates the best mole ratio. Right. Ideally, when we graph this thing, the amount of product, the precipitate, should increase and then decrease, like I said, because we have one of the reactants limiting us, we hit it perfectly, then the other one limits us. So that's why it decreases after. Then what we'll do is we'll take our data points that we've created, and we will draw best fit lines through the increasing side, the decreasing side. So you will make an X. At the point of that intersection, if you drop down, you are gonna see the optimal ratio of your reactants, which is the optimal mole ratio. If it's one of the ones we tested, it will land us right on one of our plotted points. But if it's not one of the ones we tested, we can still see what that ratio will be by simply looking at the x-axis of our graph. Like if we're going to do this method, some markers of reliability right, are what you see here. I should have three plotted data points before and after the intersection point to claim it to be a very accurate experiment. Now, there's some things that we have to keep constant as we go through, and there's some things that we don't really care about, and I'll explain why when we're graphing and talking about it. All right, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. All right. So what you see behind me here is a reaction. And I'm going to use a reaction that we know to highlight how it's going to work. And then we're going to test a reaction where we do not know, right, what the coefficients are because the oxidation state may have changed uh, in the process of what was happening. So when I react silver nitrate with potassium chromate, the first thing that's worth noting is both of these substances are soluble, right? All nitrates are soluble. So this guy really lives is Ag plus and NO3 negative. All group ones are soluble. So this guy's really living as 2K plus 
and CrO4-2. But those two things are going to be dumped into a container together. I'm going to do it in a beaker in this demo, but in reality, we're going to do it in a graduated cylinder just because the amounts that we're using. All right, but we take our AgNO3, we take our K2CrO4, and we dump them into another beaker. That just initiated a reaction. When we initiate that reaction, we're going to get products. One of our products, when we double replace, is going to be potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate is a group one. It's soluble. So in this beaker, I'm going to have floating around K pluses and NO3 negatives. Right? The other product is going to be silver chromate. And I'm able to write a formula for the silver chromate because silver always has a plus one oxidation state. Remember, it's one of the three we always remember. So because its oxidation state never changes, I can tell you its formula. But if the silver would be a different transition metal, iron or manganese or nickel or something like that, its oxidation state could change in the reaction if we were doing an oxidation reduction process, which might happen. So we wouldn't know what it is. And that's what we're trying to figure out, right? We would be able to determine that if we knew what this ratio here was. Uh, but the moral of the story is, AG doesn't have a rule for solubility, and chromates are insoluble. So I'm going to get a solid down here on the bottom, and it's going to be AG2CRO4. Right, so what we do when we're doing a continuous variations method is I'm going to take varying amounts of these two reactants, and I'm going to mix them together and monitor how much precipitate we get. The more precipitate you get, the closer you are to the optimum, the real ratio, which we know from the equation, because we know what it is, is two to one. All right, so how that's going to work is you will set up like, a series of reactions where you vary the amount of the AgNO3 and the K2CrO4. And then what we'll record is how much solid is generated. So underneath here, I'm writing what the ratio is. And what this ratio would be reflective of is what this and this coefficient would be. So if we look at the first one, I have zero of the AgNO3 and 60 of this. Obviously, this is a zero to six ratio. We would not get any product because I didn't initiate a reaction. All right, so I get a baseline point there. Here, if it's a 10 milliliters of the AgNO3 to 50. This is me testing a one to five ratio. I will start to get some precipitate. Then here I go to a 20 to 40, which would be a two to four ratio. Now it's a one to two ratio. The one being the AgNO3, the two being the K2CrO4. All right, so my one to two ratio increased more. The 30 milliliters of this with the 30 milliliters of this is us testing the one to one ratio. It increased more. We get a point there. All right here, 40 to 20. All right now we've got a four to two ratio, which is a two to one ratio, but now we switched who we put more of in. All right, that four to two ratio took me to here. Right. Then we started working the other direction. Okay, we go the 30-30, we do the 40-20, now we're the 50 to 10, now it's a 5 to 1 ratio, all right, of the AgNO3, and we start to see a decrease. And then way down here, we're back to the zero because this is a 6 to 0 ratio, so there is no K2CRO4 present, so we can't have a reaction. All right, so we get these points, and then we draw a line of best fit through them. All right, so you look at the points going uphill, which would be these. Put a ruler through as many of them as you can. And Excel will do this for you. It's called a trend line. We do that. Then we do the same thing going the other way. These ones going uphill here. Just like 
we're going through right around there. All right, trying to get through as many of those points as we can. And then we look at the point where they intersect. Extrapolate that guy down. See where it hits. Oh, cut. Oh, whoops, sorry, looks like I did that crooked. guy straight down and because i know what the outcome could be i'm going to drop it here but you would drop it from the point of intersection all right so let's make our point of intersection up a bit higher right about there all right and like i said this is just because i know what it's going to be right. and i wanted that x to drop me down to the 40 to 20 ratio because I know from our balanced equation, it was a two to one. So I just wanted your equation here to match up with what you should have seen. And because I was just doing it by hand, I couldn't scale it uh, the way you would expect. All right, so when we drop it down, this reveals the ratio. Now, if I'd have hit it dead on, which we did, we tested a point for 40, 20, hopefully these guys like intersect near there. All right. If it didn't, say the ratio was something like three to one, which was never tested here, it would have ended up dropping me somewhere down here. And you could say, oh, well, if it hit here, it would have been 45, 15, which would have been my three to one ratio. So that's the cool thing about this is by looking and extrapolating your graph, you have ratios you didn't test just by looking at what they are, right? Here's 25. 45 that would have been a ratio here's a 15 45 there's a three to one ratio all right so you know a bunch of ratios even including the ones we didn't test all right now as we do this right you can tell who limits you like right, going on the uphill and the downhill by the amounts of what you're doing so on the uphill i don't have any of the agno3 and then it goes to 10 so on the uphill the limiting reactant here is the AgNO3. But eventually, I've added so much AgNO3 that I made it in excess. So on the downhill, all right, when I'm putting 60, 50, 40 of it in, there's too much. That means I flipped it. On the downhill, the limiting reactant is going to be the K2CrO4. So you can tell who limits by looking at the ratios, all right? The lesser of the one that you have, that most often is who limits you. But listen, it's based on when the uphill stops. It's not that the moment I get past 30, 30, that this guy starts to limit. The apex was here at 40, 20. So the AGNO3 was in the best amount at 40. So it didn't start limiting me till the downhill, all right, on that graph. All right, so your limiting reactant occurs before where they cross on the substance that there's less of, and then after where they cross the other substance, all right, where there was less of. All right, so this is how we could reveal that two to one ratio. And by getting that ratio, we can uh, figure out what charges of things are. We can figure out the optimum uh, way to react them. You can learn a lot of things. Right? So that in a nutshell is the continuing variations method. All revolves around solubility, precipitates, and then these multiple ratios. All right, so some important things to note. Notice that every trial I ran had the same volume. All right, this is important because if I change the volume to be a total of something other than 60, I'm changing the ratio that I'm looking at, which is no good. So the total volume, you want to be a constant number. All right, which is why in every one that we'll do, you'll see we have a constant value uh, with our added volumes, right? Zero and 60 is 60, 10 and 50 is 60, 20 and 40 is 60, 30 and 30 is 60, right? You have to keep the total volume the same to get these ratios, which is important. All right, so what I'm going to do is walk you guys to the back. I'm going to show you the setup. This is one of those experiments uh, where we actually let it sit for a day or two to allow the precipitate to settle out. So I started the reaction on uh, Monday morning and I let it 
go all day Monday. I let it settle out last night, and now it's lunchtime here today on Tuesday. All right, so we have allowed the precipitate to fall out so we can accurately measure how many milliliters of it we have. So I'm going to walk you through what I was mixing, and then I'm going to fast forward you to the results and tell you how much of the precipitate we gathered. Then we're going to do it for a second experiment. So the first experiment we do it for, it looks like we're reacting uh, an iron nitrate with sodium hydroxide. And then the second experiment we do it for is going to be a copper chloride with a sodium phosphate. All right. And our goal in both instances is to find out what's the optimum ratio of those elements. All right. So let me take you to the back and then I'll walk you through. You guys would probably want to follow along with the procedure so that you know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay, so let's set you guys up right here. <laughs> All right, so what it tells me in my procedure is to get myself seven 100 milliliter graduated cylinders. So I'm going to the closet right here behind me. And I'm taking out seven of these guys. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. All right. Then what I would do is I, I would label Right, what they're showing you there in table one, they are telling you how much FeNO3 and how much NaOH you should put in each. So I'll go over here, get one of my markers right, that we can react. And right here on the counter in front, I'm going to put the ratio of what we're doing here, all right? So if you look in your table, they're listing the FeNO3 on top. So this one here is five to 55 of the FeNO3 to NaOH. That means we're testing a one to 11 ratio in this first one. In the second one, it's telling me to put 10 milliliters of the FeNO3 with 50 of the NaOH. Now I'm testing a one to five ratio. All right, third one is 12 to 48. Now I'm testing a one to four ratio. This one here, 15 to 45, testing a one to three ratio. Here, 17 to 43. I'm testing a two to five ratio. All right, here, 20 to 40. I'm testing a one to two ratio. And then lastly, 24, 36. I am testing a two to three ratio. All right, so the top column is the iron-based substance. The bottom column is the sodium hydroxide. So when I say it's a one to 11 ratio, it meant if this produced the most precipitate, it would be a one coefficient in front of the FeNO33 and an 11 coefficient in front of the NaOH. Notice each of them adds up to 60, all right? The volume has to be constant so that the ratio stayed true. All right, so what I did then was I went to the middle counter and I got the substance. Here's your iron nitrate solution. All right, you're going to find out that uh, iron three ions tend to be orangish in color. That'll be another thing you learn this chapter, some popular colors. Um, and popular is probably the wrong word. Uh, unique is probably more accurate because most solutions are clear and colorless, like the sodium hydroxide. All right, so all I did was I put the right ratio of each in. So I went through and I said, okay, I'm pouring five milliliters of the Fe, 10 milliliters. 12, 15, 17, 20, 24. So I poured the iron in. Then I come back and I initiate the reaction by pouring the sodium hydroxide. 
55 milliliters, 50, 48, 45, 43, 40, and 36 milliliters. Uh, I stirred those quickly to help the reaction get going, and then I gave them time to react. Okay, All right, that's generally the early part of the experiment. It says let 10 minutes, but I found we got much better results if we let them sit overnight. All right, that's all part one of the experiment. All right, part two all right, had me do the same thing, but it changed substances on me. All right, in part two, instead of using iron nitrate and sodium hydroxide, it had me use copper chloride and sodium phosphate. All right, they also changed the ratios. All right, we still use 60 milliliters, but we did it a little bit differently. So I'm going to go get a different pen. To show you what was going on with that one. All right, so if you're looking at that table two, the top part is the CuCl2, and the bottom part is the Na3PO4. And then we change ratios. This time they had us do a 10 to 50 to start, which was a 1 to 5 ratio. Second time, they had us do a 20 to 40 ratio, which is a 1 to 2 ratio. Then it was 24, 36, which was a 2 to 3 ratio. Then here we went 30, 30, which was a 1 to 1 ratio. This one, 36, 24, which is a 3 to 2 ratio. 40, 20 which is two to one. And then lastly, 50, 10 the other way, which was five to one. All right, so we just changed what the ratios were. In this one, it was one to 11, and we were testing the one to five, changing the graph, okay? All right, but the setup is the same. We're just using different amounts. And then I came through and I used the copper two chloride and the sodium phosphate And the copper two chloride, copper two ions are bluish in nature. And like most substances, the sodium phosphate is clear and colorless. So same process, right? 10 of the copper two chloride, 20, 24, 30, 36, 40, 50. And this was in a different set of seven, of course, right? I didn't add it on top of the ones that were in there. And then we come back and it's the 50, the 40, the 36, the 30, the 24, the 20. It stirred those up let those react. All right, so I gave those time to react, right, and what we're going to be looking for when we go over to the other side of the lab is how much precipitate formed. How much solid did we get? And like I said, we would expect it to be increasing and then decreasing because somewhere here in the middle is our optimum ratio of what we're looking for. All right, so I'm going to take you guys over there and show you your results. All right, so we're gonna start with the iron-based ones. My procedure over here. Uh, and here's a look at your iron-based substances. And so here, where we start, that was our first one. Working our way up, notice the amount of solid you're getting is increasing. And then over here, it's looking different. Now, one thing I would talk about if we were in lab is at the beginning, you're getting the precipitate being formed. Once you change past the limiting reactant, when the limiting reactant flips, it actually makes this solution a little bit acidic. And when it does it, it starts to dissolve some of the precipitate, which is why we're seeing over here right, that it's a lot tougher to see the solid. The good news is, is I'm giving you the results, so it won't matter. All right, so if I work you guys through your column to fill in your data table, 
All right? Here's what you guys want to record in your data table. All right? For that first cylinder, which was a 5 to 55 ratio, all right, and it was an 11 to 1 with what we were testing, we got about 1 milliliter of precipitate. For the second one, the 10 to 50, that's the 1 to 5 ratio, we got 10 milliliters of precipitate. For the third one, the 12 to 48 ratio, which was testing 1 to 4, was 14 milliliters. The fourth one, the 15 to 45, right, which was the 1 to 3 ratio, that was this one, right, that one got me 20 milliliters. Right, the fifth one, which was the 17 to 43 ratio, that one's getting me a four milliliter precipitate volume. The sixth one, which is this one, right, that was only getting me the 20 to 40 ratio. I was getting one milliliter. And then the last one, which was the 24, 36, right, that was a zero. So like I said, it flat lines hard because you end up becoming soluble and it dissolves away any of the precipitate that you might have. All right, so one more time across the bottom so you have it. Cylinder one is a one to 10 ratio, is a one, sorry. Cylinder one is one milliliter of precipitate. Cylinder two, 10 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder three, 14 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder four, 20 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder five, four milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder six, one milliliter of precipitate, cylinder seven, zero milliliters of precipitate. All right, so these are your results for trial one. And now you guys will have to generate your graph to plot your uphill, plot the other uphill, drop it down. What is the ratio? And it's going to reveal what is the ideal ratio of the FENO3 to the NaOH. That was the whole goal of what we were trying to figure out. Into part two, we were doing the same thing for a different reaction. So I'm going to slide you to the other side of the lab. Uh, these guys here look a little bit different. Like I said, copper-based compounds tend to be blue. And this one here happens sometimes, which is kind of wild. So I wanted to show it to you. All right. it, we actually suspended the precipitate. All right, so I didn't have the heart to knock it down to the bottom because I'm going to give you guys the number anyway. But you can see as I just started to shake it, blue solid is now falling to the bottom. And the more I would do that, the more you would see that blue solid all right, fall down. All right, but as we worked our way across, you can see we were gradually increasing. And then we start decreasing. And once that guy fell, you'd be able to see that. But once again, I'm going to give you guys all right, the data all right, for how many milliliters we would be reading off of the graduated cylinder all right, from this. All right, but basically what I'm doing is I'm just seeing where the solid gets to and recording it, which is just a little tough visual. All right, so for our copper... Uh, chloride with the sodium phosphate reaction. Four cylinder one, which is testing the 1050, which is the one to five ratio. You had 11 milliliters of precipitate. Four cylinder two, the 20 to 40, which is a one to two ratio. You got 22 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder three, this guy. 24 to 36, which is a 2 to 3 ratio. That got you 24 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder 4, the 30-30 ratio, 1 to 1, got me 28 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder 5, the 36-24, which is the 3 to 2 ratio, that got me 35 milliliters of precipitate. Cylinder six, which was the 40-20, it's a two to one ratio, 
we dropped down to 31 milliliters. And the 50 to 10, which was the 5 to 1 at the end, that got us 21 milliliters. So one more time, working my way across the bottom for those precipitate results. Uh, cylinder 1, 11 milliliters. Cylinder 2, 22 milliliters. Cylinder 3, 24 milliliters. Cylinder 4, 28 milliliters. Cylinder 5, 35 milliliters. Cylinder 6, 31 milliliters. And cylinder 7 is 21 milliliters. All right. All right. So that's all the data you guys should need to be able to generate your graphs and have some success. When you get to the post lab, right, the first thing it wants you to do right, is graph those out. Right? You guys can do this in Excel. You can do it in Google Sheets. Now, it's not going to let you graph two things on the x-axis. All right, so what you would need to do is pick one of your two substances, all right, and just use one of the two reactant amounts on the x-axis with what the volume of the milliliters of precipitate was on the y. Don't graph both of them. You'll know right? Oh, it's the third point in, it was this ratio, but the graph isn't going to let you graph two things on the x-axis. So just do on the x-axis, say the FeNO3 versus the milliliters of precipitate for the first one and the CuCl2, we'll say, for the second one. All right, so that's my first tip for attacking post-lab questions. All right, post-lab two wants you to determine your intersection point, drop it down, see what that is, and then tell me what the ratio is. So do that for both reactions. All right, three says, explain how this method allows you to find the mole rat ratio of the reactants. Look back to the pre-lab. I talked you through it in the pre-lab. Why do we have to keep a constant volume? Talked about that in the pre-lab. Go ahead back, see if you can find it. Five, is it necessary for the concentrations to be the same, right? So uh, I told you the concentration of the CuCl was 0.05 and the FeNO3 is 0.10. What they're asking you is, could I change what the molarity is? And if I change the molarity, is it gonna change the outcome of the experiment? Do we think that the potency of the solution is gonna affect right, this overall process? That's what question five is saying. Uh, six is asking you, what is a limiting reactant? All right. Seven is saying on the uphills, who limit you, right? So it's saying, look at the uphill for each of your two graphs. Who's limiting me on the uphill graph? Like who's limiting me on the downhill? So there's actually going to be four answers there. The uphill on each and then the downhill on each. All right. Question eight says, uh, why is it more accurate to use the point of intersection than the two lines to find the more ratio? Again, I talked about that in the pre-lab. Uh, you can go back and find it. All right, so that's some tips to help you guys attack your post-lab questions. Uh, bounce ideas off your partner. I'll be around as well. All right, uh, but I hope this gives you an idea about the continuing variations method and how it all ties into like the solution chem we've been tackling this chapter. All right, I will talk to you guys soon.